Hi, I'm Annie Onishi, and I'm a trauma surgeon. And this is Each and Every Injury in Home Alone. We're gonna be talking about all of the injuries from Home Alone parts one and two, three and four. We don't have time for that. This is it, don't get scared now. That first fall looks like the most severe in this series. He's up a couple of steps, he gets full air, and then he lands flat on his back. That's gonna be a lot of force right on that landing surface. So Harry's second fall doesn't look as severe or dramatic as his first, but it is in the context of having already had a great big fall and a great big impact. So if his ribs weren't broken before, I bet you they're broken now. When our ribs break, the little edges can sort of dislodge and damage internal organs. So from the back, they can ding a kidney, they can ding a liver, they can ding a spleen. So my guess is a bunch of broken ribs, plus or minus hemoneumothorax, plus or minus splenic lac. Marv falls down a bunch of stairs, but he sort of is at a ground level when he does it and sort of seems like a little bit less velocity and force. So I do think Marv is a little younger, which may explain why he's able to bounce back from this injury a little faster. <laughs> So looking straight up and having the iron land on his face, what that's going to do is what's called an axial loading injury. So there's a bunch of load compressing the spine from top to bottom. This is most commonly seen in the context of a young, usually intoxicated person jumping off of a bridge or the edge of a pool into a shallow pool of water and their head strikes the bottom of either the lake or the pond or the pool. We have a ground level fall with a head strike on the back. What we worry about from these ground level falls is something called a coup contra coup injury. So we strike the back of our head, yeah, our brain gets rocked from there. But then as the brain settles down, because it sits in a cavity of fluid, it hits the front of the skull as well. So you may expect to see some bleeding in the back of the brain accompanied by some bleeding in the front of the brain as the brain sort of rocks about the skull cavity itself. Well. We know that Harry and Marv are in for a whole world of suffering tonight. You can see how sensitive they seem to be to what is probably more of a sensation of sort of like a bee sting. It could cause some damage if it hit you right in the eyeball, if it was really close range like that. But in general, every pellet injury I've ever seen has just been in the fat. If I had to guess what type of burn this is gonna be, my guess is gonna be a second degree, which is a partial thickness burn. So it burns off the epidermis part of the dermis, which is the deeper layer of skin. The important difference between second degree burns and third degree burns is that with the second degree burns, you don't lose the little stem cells that live in those layers of skin. So it will heal without a scar. So while he's branded with the McAllister M now, that's not gonna be permanent. I would consider a burn what's called a distracting injury. So because the burn hurts so bad and is so dramatic and the patient is so worried about it, they may not have noticed that they fell down a few stairs. So Marv has lost his socks, lost his shoes. He is stepping on this nail here. It looks like it goes in about an inch or two. Puncture injuries are notoriously high risk for infection. This tiny little deep hole that is dark and warm and full of blood and is a great place for bacteria to grow. You can tell he's gotten good first aid training because he dunks his head in the snow. It's probably mostly steam coming off from his head. You can see that he's lost a bunch of his hair and then the skin doesn't have that pink appearance that his hand had, so probably not as deep of a burn, but still definitely very painful. You know, I think at this point, um, Harry and Marv really should be suspicious that they are invading the house of some sort of psychopath. <laughs> with like some very sadistic tendencies and I would have turned away at this point already. My concern is that with um, glue on this fresh burn on his head and then feathers on, his, on the burn, 
I think that's going to make wound care really difficult. So some poor burn nurse is going to have to go through and pick out every last little bit of feather from that burn. And that surface area of that burn is way too big to numb up well. So he would just have to sort of sit there as they picked out little bits of feather from his burn skin. I think that's really going to hurt. Having abandoned entering the house through any particular door because of all the booby traps, here we have Marv sneaking through a window and encountering a bunch of Christmas ornaments. That very fine glass that you see that the ornaments are made of, when that shatters, it splinters. Um, and those little fine bits of glass are impossible to get out. It leads to a lot of pain, a lot of torture for both the patient and whoever's trying to pick out all that glass. I'm going to kill this kid! Well, the patient's going to go home with the sensation of glass in his feet, and he's just going to have to continue to keep his feet soaked, and this stuff will work its way out eventually. <laughs> Maybe these guys should get their eyes checked, because the ground in front of you should always be within your field of view. So for them to not have seen those cars makes me a little concerned that maybe from all these head injuries, they may have some sort of visual defect. No way to really know without further testing, but definitely makes me a little suspicious. When the neck hyperextends like that at a fast rate with a lot of acceleration and deceleration, you can get something called a hangman's fracture, which is when the second cervical vertebrae breaks in a couple of places. It's a really unstable fracture. It can be a very high risk for a devastating cord injury at that level. The lay term for these hyperextension type injuries is whiplash. Whiplash really refers to all the muscular stiffness you get after a big um, hyperextension injury like that. So now we have a couple of other injuries in rapid sequence. So not only do we have this hyperextension injury of the neck, then we have a heavy object in the form of Harry landing on Marv. So if Marv's ribs weren't broken before, my bet is they're gonna be broken now. This little sequence, um, at a very minimum, we have at least soft tissue damage from a whiplash injury. At the worst, we have something like a hangman's fracture, a hyperextension injury of the neck. We have then a fall from height, we have a head strike, and then we have crushed by a heavy falling object. There he is! That wire is very thick and very obvious, so they couldn't see it. Again, I'm really worried about their visual fields. There just looks like they're not able to see anything below about nose level. It's very concerning. <laughs> a crowbar is gonna cause a lot of damage because that's, that's just a heavy metal object with a lot of directed force at one particular location. It's kind of hard to see exactly where this blow lands, but it looks sort of epigastrium, which is the sort of upper part of the central abdomen to maybe some ribs or sternal area. This assault with the crowbar right in this area to me is very reminiscent of something we call a handlebar injury. So when somebody is riding their bike and they crash and their handlebars jam into their epigastric area and squishes all the organs and, and bruises them, lacerates them. So that can really cause a lot of damage. <laughs> Whenever our bodies decelerate in such a fashion, be it in a car, on a bicycle, motorcycle, or swinging from a rope directly into a brick wall, all of our organs continue moving until they hit the brick wall and they stop. That's called a deceleration injury. A lot of our organs, including our heart or aorta, our small intestine, our colon, they're tethered to the body wall in certain locations. So when we decelerate, things tear about that tether. These deceleration injuries can be really subtle. You can't necessarily see them on a CAT scan unless you were a special type of CAT scan or unless you have a very uh, high suspicion for such a thing. <laughs> As bleeding in the skull accumulates and pushes on the brain and the brain swells, there's nowhere for the brain to go because the skull is a fixed, compact cavity. So when the brain continues to swell, the only place for it to go is down and out, which is called a herniation. So after this assault with the shovel, we see both guys completely passed out total loss of consciousness. But then a couple minutes later, these guys are back up walking and talking. This makes me really concerned for something called an epidural hematoma. What that means is that there's blood accumulating in the epidural space, which is underneath the skull, but outside the brain and expanding slowly. Classically, these people have a big head bonk 
maybe from a shovel. They come to, and then they have what's called a lucid interval. But slowly but surely, as that blood expands within the epidural space, they then start to lose consciousness again and can even go on to herniate and die pretty quickly. So this is actually a story we get all the time, especially from the ski hill um, or after a bar fight and everybody's like, okay, he's okay, he's gonna walk it off. And then five, 10 minutes later, they've lost consciousness again. And so we just saw each and every injury in Home Alone 1. Either these guys are really tough or they've got a great trauma doctor because they're gonna be back for Home Alone 2. What? Lesson number one is don't mess with New Yorkers because that's what's going to happen to you. But with a good solid right hook like that, typically the point of impact is the cheekbone here. This is something called the zygomatic arch. This is a relatively fragile bone as far as facial structures go. This is often the first thing to break when somebody gets hit, especially when their face is turning. It looks like a pretty solid punch, but I think knowing these guys, I think they'll recover. <laughs> Well, it looks like Harry suffers a pretty decent fall from height and absolutely crushes this car. Harry is rendered speechless by this fall. So that's either just the wind getting knocked out of him is sort of the lay term. Um, he may have broken a couple of ribs and maybe uh, gotten what's called the pneumothorax, which is when the lungs collapse and air is building up inside the thoracic cavity, but outside the lungs. That could make it pretty difficult to speak or to get words out. I think out of all the injuries that we will review today, this series of injuries is probably one of the more severe ones. It's probably a tie uh, between four bricks to the head from a high height versus the shovel to the head by the neighbor. So his inability to speak could be the sign of a pretty severe brain bleed inside, especially over the area that controls our speech, which is usually the left side of our brain, sort of depends on the patient. Definitely at this point, Marv would need to be rushed over to the hospital to get checked out for his head trauma. Well, a nail gun to the buttock or the face, I, the ER doc could just pull that out and there's nothing majorly critical in those areas. The nail straight to the groin, the thing I would be concerned about is an underlying vascular injury, such as to the femoral vein or the femoral artery. If there was an expanding hematoma, which means blood pooling up underneath the nail, that would be a reason to go to the operating room to do a nice cut down, get all the vasculature exposed and remove that nail under really controlled circumstances. Every fall from height is a little bit different. The injury pattern is pretty recognizable. So depending on whether your ribs are broken, whether your back is broken, whether you have any other orthopedic injuries to your either your pelvis, or your extremities, solid organ injuries like uh, lacerating your spleen or your liver from your fall, that's gonna determine what needs to be done for you in the hospital and what long-term consequences you could expect. With rib fractures, those people are in a pretty real amount of pain for four to six to eight weeks, but certainly a bad accident or a bad fall from height can lead to lots of problems with chronic pain in the future. I've reached the top. Here, Marv is falling straight from the first floor. That's a pretty decent height and he falls flat on his front and his face. That is a pretty bad way to land. All of our bony structures at that moment of impact are gonna compress and thereby squish all of our organs inside. So in addition to breaking stuff like his sternum, the fronts of his ribs, potentially his arms, any fall from height, no matter how you land, you're, you're probably gonna mess some stuff up. We suffer brain injuries more when the brain is rocked within the fixed cavity of the skull than really from just direct blows. This pile of tools landing on him where things are just falling from the top down and just compressing the skull on top of the neck and the spine. So definitely would expect some brain trauma with this, potentially some neck trauma. It looks like they also hit sort of the shoulder and the arms and some other things. So we would really have to check this guy carefully for other orthopedic injuries. 
This is really reminding me of a phenomenon that we have here in Central Oregon called black ice. That happens overnight when just the water vapor from the air just freezes right on the cement and makes this tiny imperceptible layer of ice. So from the months of about October to January, we get tons and tons of patients just like Marv who are slipping and sliding on the way out to the car, trying to catch their balance and off they go. Super common to see broken arms, broken wrists, broken ribs from just a big fall on some cements. Another injury that we see here, which is a really feared injury, is something called a straddle injury. So as Marv is sliding towards this bookshelf, we can see him run into this post between his legs at a decent amount of velocity, be it a motorcycle, a bicycle, commonly a fence post as someone is hopping a fence, gets jammed up between the legs, and it's obviously a very unpleasant pleasant series of injuries. That can lead to urogenital trauma, that can lead to, lead to rectal trauma, it can lead to hematomas in places where you really don't want hematomas, and they can be really hard to deal with and very difficult to control. I know I keep saying this, but actually I think this is the most lethal mechanism we have seen yet to date. This is a high voltage electrical injury. As the current travels through the body, the body tissues act as a resistor, which produces heat as electricity travels through. So pretty much anything in the line of fire from that source to where the patient's grounded is just gonna get fried. The most dangerous things that can happen are cardiac arrhythmias. So the heart is an electrified organ, so a big, dose of electricity is gonna send the heart into all kinds of crazy rhythms. It can cause kidney failure. It can cause the muscle tissue anywhere in the body basically just to melt and liquefy, which leads to something called rhabdomyolysis. And it can lead to something called compartment syndrome. So as all the tissues in the body are damaged and they start leaking water, they swell. I think Kevin McAllister needs some help. <laughs> This is an explosion and a fire within a closed space of a toilet and a small bathroom. Inhalational injury is what happens when a patient suffers a burn in a closed space. So most commonly within a car fire, the airway is subject to superheated air and other uh, chemicals that are burning. What that leads to is severe swelling of the airway to the point that the airway can actually swell shut. That's gonna be a giant heat sink with a lot of mechanical force from the explosion directly to the face and airways. I probably think that this is gonna be a non-survivable injury, but maybe I'll be proven wrong. Oh. My main piece of advice to these guys would be to stop pulling on strings and ropes in this house, because only bad things happen when they do that. This is one construction accident I've seen many times. My number one recommendation is you should always have a buddy when you're using a ladder, even if you think it's simple, even if you think it's safe, just have somebody down at the bottom stabilizing things. I mean, Harry has Marv, Marv has Harry. That's the beauty of their relationship. He looks to be about five, six feet off the ground and hits. His head's definitely gonna rock with that impact. Definitely a high risk for a concussion here. I'm really, really shocked and amazed by Marv and Harry. Home Alone Part Two, this house of horrors, is way more dangerous than the house back in Chicago. I think these injuries look a lot more serious. But despite all that, they've just really done a great job of getting themselves up, dusting themselves off, and continuing on. So quick little anatomy lesson about the nose. So most of the nose that you can feel is actually made of soft, squishy cartilage. So it's not likely to break or deform in any way. So typically if patients have broken a nose, it doesn't look squished in the front like what these two guys have. What it looks like is either flattened to one side or if it's been broken in this way, it looks flattened, but um, only really between the eyes and then really, really swollen, accompanied by a couple of black eyes too.
In medicine and in surgery, we talk about something called the LD50, which means the lethal dose of something at which 50% of people when exposed will die. The LD50 for a fall from height is largely, largely accepted as four stories. So anybody who falls four stories or more has more than 50% chance of death. I think this particular incident is especially dangerous for Harry who falls from what I would consider a lethal height then his friend lands on top of him. Then a bunch of paint cans fall from even higher and land on top of him too. So those are three pretty dangerous mechanisms all at once. I think the actual pecking itself is not likely to be that dangerous. However, if you spend a large amount of time in very close proximity to pigeons, they carry a number of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic means a disease that you can catch from an animal um, that can be pretty dangerous to humans. There's a couple different types of pneumonia you can pick up from a pigeon, um, namely something called histoplasmosis. Well, all my friends living in New York, if you see a pigeon nesting on your windowsill, you should try to get rid of them because they have these little mites and they can apparently crawl through your window and infest your bed and then infest you. There you have it. That was each and every injury in Home Alone.